unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha. I'm your host, Milan Bashanov of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Here's a hard truth about policy conversations on India. We rarely hear about India's Northeast. In fact, in doing more than 50 episodes of this podcast, not even one has been dedicated to the Northeastern region of the country. And yet, the Northeast is a region of immense geostrategic importance. It is home to nearly 50 million Indian citizens. It's also home to South Asia's longest-running armed conflict, where over 50,000 people have died. And yet, it is often written off as a footnote, an outlier, or part of the periphery. To enlighten us, and hopefully to educate us as well, about this often overlooked corner of India, I'm pleased to welcome Bina Lakshmi Nepram to the show. Bina is the founder of the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network and also serves as convener of the Northeast India Women's Initiative for Peace. She joins me today by the phone. Bina, thanks for coming on. Thank you, uh, Milan. It's wonderful to be at the Grand Tamasha. <laughs> I, I hope <laughs> I got all of those uh, affiliations correct. They're quite <laughs> quite a mouthful. <laughs> and I want to talk about um, both of those organizations I, I mentioned. But let me start perhaps by, you know, talking about the topic that, you know, is on everyone's mind, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. India, uh, as our listeners know, has not remained untouched by this virus. As of today, India has close to about 100,000 active cases. I believe your home state of Manipur has somewhere around 50 or 60 active cases at the moment. Uh, what can you tell us, Bina, about the impact that COVID has had in the northeast of India thus far? The northeast of India, which is this uh, very geostrategic area, uh, which is sandwiched between five nations, China, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal. This actually was a green zone when the red, rest of India was red and orange zone. So it was quite interesting that this part of India actually was had a, one of the lowest cases, like Manipur had one case in, in March and two cases in April. Uh, and so in, in that way, we were absolutely glad that there was not much of the damage that the pandemic has done. But of late, what has happened is uh, two things happened. One, as you mentioned, Milan, that the northeast of India has seen one of the longest running armed conflicts. So we have over uh, like more than 300,000 troops of the Indian armed forces all over our territories. So the first major COVID case actually came out in the border security force camp in Tripura, which is one of the uh, neighbors of Manipur, where over 163 cases have been in the border security force camp. So many of the CRPF and many of these places where the military base became centers. The other, other thing is in terms of uh, what happened after the lockdown was imposed by Prime Minister Modi, a lot of people from the northeast of India who live in India's metropolitan cities started fleeing Gujarat, you know, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Mumbai, uh, Chennai, Telangana, all these places. So as a result, the number of cases now overruns to over a thousand in Assam and in Manipur, uh, around 50 or 60, as you mentioned. So this is a situation right now. I want to step back and try to place India's Northeast in context, you know, especially for some of our global listeners. As I mentioned at the outset, and you repeated, you know, the Northeast is a region that is so often ignored, not just by those living abroad, but even by most Indians. When you stop and look around, Bina, how does the Northeast fit into India's kind of popular imagination? How would you characterize it? Yes, thank you. Uh, popular imagination. India has has not even started to imagine the Northeast. So you see, in terms of India's strategy, we are all a direction in the Northeast. Uh, and also, it is always seen in the security lens, the way in which if you ask any Indian today, do you know anyone from the Northeast? They will say, Oh, the chinkies, that's the term given to us. People with small Chinese eyes, snub noses, you know, Chipta Nag, as uh, for, former Foreign uh, Minister Susila Saraj once said in Parliament, Chipta Nag means flat nose. So in terms of um, 
India's popular imagination, the northeast of India is yet to register. And this is something which, uh, as someone who was born in the northeast and having come to New Delhi, uh, I was first asked which country I was from when I landed in Delhi. So it was very shocking for me because I thought I was Indian till people in India asked me, Madam, which country are you from? Up Nepali ho, up Thai ho. They always asked if I was Nepali or Thai, but never an Indian. So um, I faced that kind of uh, discrimination when I arrived in Delhi uh, to do my physics. So it was, that is one thing which I would like to, and the other notion which India has about the Northeast is that everyone there eats anything that moves in terms of our diet, you know? So uh, a lot of, uh, uh, because a lot of our people eat herbs and more of that. So we, I started eating spices when I was in Delhi in a, in a more rigorous manner, uh, things like that. So in terms of the imagination, number one uh, is, and I have, um, during my time in Delhi, I tried to understand what is happening. And this is what I found, Milan. First, the northeast of India's history, rich culture, geography, um, you know, particularly the rich history of northeast is absent in the textbooks of India since India got independence. As a result, we do not exist in the memory of India. Today, I can talk about Rani Ki Jhansi or you know, Vikramaditya and all of this, Ashoka the Great or you know, the Mughals, but ask anyone from Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata about northeast of India, they will know nothing. So we have a huge policy failure, which has resulted in the rest of India not able to imagine the northeast people. So till today, we, we are considered what I call half citizens in the world's largest democracy. The other thing, Milan, is not just in the absence in the history books of India, number two, is the fact that the northeast of India do not belong to India's caste system. You know, I call what I call we are outcast in the sense of within bracket outcast, because in many parts of northeast of India, we don't have the Indian caste system like you see in the rest of the country. As a result, when I was always asked, Bina, what caste are you from? And I said, I belong to a human being caste. You know, what caste do I should belong to? So that's one thing which, in, in terms of India's caste imagination, we are absent. And the other thing is that uh, during the British colonial times, there was the inner line permit, and currently uh, the government of India uh, sort of inherited that. And today, if, if you or who come from abroad or anyone from the rest of India comes to the Northeast, you need what is called inner line permit. And for foreigners, you would lead what is called restricted area permit. It is called like a visa within a visa. As a result, um, you know, many of, uh, you know, people who come are not even allowed in many of our territories. As a result, no journalists are, are allowed, no international humanitarian aid agencies are allowed. So this region has been actually locked out uh, from the consciousness of not of India, but from the consciousness of the entire world. So this is what we are blanked out in the history books of India. We're absent in the media. If you look at any Washington Post uh, or, uh, you know, Washington um, you know, Post or New York Times, any discussion about India absolutely is absent about what's happening in our part of the world. And this is something which I have seen. You know, Bina, the challenge faced by citizens of the Northeast is not simply neglect. It's, as you mentioned, you know, Northeasterners who live all across you know, other parts of India are also victims of systemic, systematic discrimination. You know, there was a government committee that was established to look into this. It submitted its report to the Home Ministry back in 2014. I believe you were a part of those discussions. What did the committee find? And do you think things have changed over the past six years since that committee submitted its report? Yes. Uh, for the uh, you know benefit of your listeners, I would like to share uh, what is the northeast of India in terms of like a lot of people in the northeast of India belong to the Mongoloid race and plus the language that we speak is more tibeto burman Australoid languages. I speak a language called Maite Lon. Uh, for example, if I say how are you, Nungai Ribra means how are you. It's a tibeto burman group of languages. Um, 
And so what happens is that when people from the northeast of India goes to the rest of India, and again, as I mentioned, because of the absence in the textbooks of our country, uh, even in popular media like films or television, our faces are not there, our culture is not there. So we face a lot of rampant racism. So 82% of people from the northeast of India, when they go to live, work, or study in the rest of India, 82% face racism. So just like we are seeing in a very tragic way with the George Lloyd case in America right now and the violence which has erupted, in 2014, Milan, a 19-year-old uh, boy called Nido Tanya was beaten to death in the streets of Lajpat Nagar in Delhi because of the way he looks. He got into a fight with some of the people, community people, and then they beat him to death in the streets of Delhi. I was a part of the protest which asked for the government of India to start looking into this issue because we said enough is enough. Before that, I have handled many cases because I had an office in Delhi, a think in Delhi called Control Arms Foundation of India, where we took our issues to negotiate with you know, prime minister's office or the members of parliament on this issue. And just like the George Lloyd case, the Nidotonia case in India became the tipping point in which India started for the first time in its history to recognize the existence of racism. Because India actually, uh, I, you know, sort of denied, I was called secessionist for saying that there's racism in India. I was told I was trying to divide India by saying that there's racism in India. So we face a lot of challenges, but somehow people, thousands of people poured the streets of Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata at the time, just as we are seeing in the United States. And we were able to meet the press th that, that time, uh, the government of India. And in fact, the Bezboro Committee was formed in February, just a month after Nidotania was killed in the streets of Delhi, and the Bezboro Committee was formed. This committee asked for the recognition that India should have an anti-racial law. India should recognize the specific issues faced by the people of Northeast, ensure the inclusion of history in Indian textbooks, ensure that books, uh, television, you know, print media, Indian media is able to include and publish our, our articles, our voices, our faces, so that the rest of India can imagine that India's face doesn't look like just Deepika Padukone or look like, you know, Priyanka Chopra or whatever. So we wanted to share that there are Indians who, whose eyes may be a little smaller, whose eyes may look like a little bit like East Asians, but we are Indians nonetheless, that India is a land of immense diversity. But unfortunately, Milan, the problem with government of India is they do not listen to what the people are saying. I have been in the field of community work as well as advocacy as a think tank, as well as someone who deeply works on the ground for 15 years of my life. And government policymakers do not listen to what the community is saying. I think as a result, the Bezborough Committee is stuck, even just as a report, and it's tragic. And we have been telling the government of India, they must implement this right now. And we also ask for the formation of a national diversity policy. Can you imagine a country of 1.3 billion people uh, Milan doesn't have a national diversity policy. India doesn't have a multicultural policy. For example, Canada has a ministry on multicultural affairs. India doesn't have. So I think it's really high time that we call a spade a spade and to get over some of these issues so that we can have a deeply diverse uh, country and celebrate the diversity rather than othering the people of northeast of India. So I want to kind of get into your own personal life story. But before I do that, I think it might be useful if you could help sort of break down for our listeners the conflict in Manipur. You know, what was the initial trigger for the unrest in your home state? And where does the conflict stand today, you know, sitting here in the year 2020? Yeah. Um, yes, that's such an important question. And I'll explain why. The name Manipur means land of jewels. Manipur was an independent Asiatic nation state, Milan, like Bhutan, Nepal. And a lot of people in India, because our history is not in the textbooks of India, people do not know 
that the northeast of India is home, was home to four independent Asiatic nation states. Sikkim, Tripura, Manipur, Assam were independent Asiatic nation states. And, you know, and as a result, we had our own kind of, uh, you know, a monarchy, we had our own governance, we had our own, all of that was, was, was happening. In fact, uh, so this was the history of Manipur. And then it came under British colonial rule in 1891. In fact, it is the last sort of in, in, in the Indian subcontinent, Indian Asian subcontinent to be annexed to the British Empire was Manipur in 1891. And as a result, three of our prince and the, the, the commander in chief of Manipur armed forces were actually hanged in Manipur's polo ground in 1891 by the British colonial rule. So this is what happened to Manipur. Manipur has about 3,000 year old history. In fact, let me read out just to give you an idea about the history from my book, Mekle. It's the old name given. Manipur was called Polo Men by the Chinese. <laughs> It was called Kate by the Burmese. And I wrote this in my book, which will tell you a timeline. Manipur, land of a thousand wars, attacked by the Chinese in 1200s, devastated by the Burmese in 1820s, colonized by British in 1890s, occupied by armed forces in, uh, Indian armed forces in 1949, interspersed by guerrillas in 1970s, Manipur, land of a thousand wars, when you, will you ever wrap yourself into pristine yards of peace ever again? This little phrase that I wrote in my book, Mekle, actually demonstrates the years, like the centuries of history that Manipur have. In 1949, the political conflict in Manipur started because, according to historical records, a Manipur king was put under house arrest and forced to sign the merger agreement. And then later, uh, military rule was imposed in the Manipur and northeast of India, starting from 1958, Milan. So in India, uh, Manipur and the northeast of India is the area where the Martial Law Armed Forces Special Powers Act has been imposed nonstop till today, since the year 1958. India is the only country in the world which doesn't have a war, but an emergency law called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. So this is how I, I this is how the history of our region and what happened is for many of us. But uh, people of Manipur did not pick up arms till about 1970s. In fact, people used theater, music, literature, newspapers to tell the government of India that good governance must be done to the people of Manipur. But then, when good governance was not done, and I think then the start of conflict started in the late 70s. I, as a child growing up in the late 70s and 80s, for me, the day I was born, my parents told me there was military curfew. There was military curfew. And um, I wouldn't be doing this work, Milan, if things became better in, in Manipur and in the northeast of India. In fact, things got worse. In 1970s and 80s, there were one or two groups, armed groups, and there was heavy, uh, you know, when Armed Forces Special Powers Act was clamped very heavily, what I saw was lots of military and a lot of armed groups at the same time. So it was very, very scary times. For example, in Manipur, I never knew what was nightlife. Our, our world stopped at about four o'clock. Uh, we don't have what is called evening meetings because, uh, you know, and for me, I tasted freedom when I was able to board a subway in New York City at 10 o'clock at night, I knew what freedom meant as a person who grew up in one of the worst, world's most militarized zones. So that's a situation which persists till today. We have more than 20,000 women widowed in Manipur in this conflict. Every day, three to four people are shot dead, what I call slow killing. It's not like what happened in Rwanda, where you know, three, 3 million people, 300,000 people are killed in months. There's a very slow killing go going on in the northeast of India. And this is what pains our hearts and our minds over this. I've lost my niece in a bomb blast in this conflict. And I know so many families in Manipur and northeast who have lost loved ones. We have more than 1,500 cases of extrajudicial executions. 
committed by the state, both Manipur police as well as Indian Armed Forces, which is currently pending in the Indian Supreme Court. So this is a tragedy of Manipur, which we are seeking for help from think tanks, from policymakers to help deepen our democracy. So I want to ask you about uh, the moment you decided to found this organization, the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network. Uh, Christmas Eve 2004, there was a 27-year-old man who was killed outside of the state capital of Imphal. Uh, a group of three gunmen dragged him out of his workshop, shot him dead. The murder was never solved, uh, but you helped his widow get back on her feet. And my understanding is that experience was what started to trigger uh, the idea of creating this group. Tell us a little bit more about why you formed this group. Why did you put it together? And what's its core mission? How would you define it? Yes. Yes. Um, I came from Manipur to Delhi uh, to do my physics honors. I wanted to be a physicist. And, um, and I was very much interested in scholarship, my studies, but Milan, there's something about life is when you get further away from home, you started realizing the problems there. For me, as a child, as a young girl growing up in Manipur, and when you grew up in a war zone, I all thought the bombings, the combing operations, Indian Army coming and doing and checking our, our kitchens, our homes, under our beds, I thought that was normal. I also thought it was normal that armed groups come and try to put their guns in our home. I thought even that was normal. Till when I came to Delhi, it was then I started realizing that I actually grew up in abnormal situation. And, you know, I still sometimes have nightmares when you have this PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, where you feel that army or someone in a fatigue is chasing you, you know. It's, it's this constant state of fear that one grows up with. But I was so lucky to come. I did my master's in Indian history, five years to realize that there was not a single line of Manipur's history in the Indian textbooks. I mean, that was the only thing I learned after having done five years of Indian history. I specialized in modern Indian history. Then uh, in protest, I stopped history and I joined international relations in JNU. And JNU was fantastic. I really thank JNU for giving me the space I was able to investigate what was going on in Manipur, in the School of International Relations, specializing in South Asia studies. So I joined MPhil PhD in JNU, looking at where I mapped. So what happened was my grounding of my work in Manipur actually was conceptualized in JNU, where I looked at the different papers I was writing and I stumbled into a document for looking at small arms and light weapons trafficking in, in, and I was attracted to this because I realized so much guns in Manipur. So my work actually started, uh, my basic work, seminal work started on mapping armed conflict in the Northeast of India. Then I was, as a child growing up, I was surrounded by guns. So um, I wanted to take out the fear of guns. So I started investigating what type of guns are flooding Manipur. And Milan, I discovered you know, guns of more than 13 countries, 58 type of guns <laughs> from more than, you know, 11 countries flooding Manipur and northeast of India. And for me as a child, I always thought if you are scared of something, like they say, uh, even in the dark, a rope looks like a snake. So for me uh, to investigate guns and violence for me was a way of trying to find what's happening to be able to find solutions to this crisis. So I had a very basic ground research on why the conflict, and that's when I realized that not just about the political conflict in Manipur, Milan, this is a very interesting angle, I also discovered around the same time that uh, you know, armed conflict was rising in Manipur, this was also the time where narco-trafficking also started up in the northeast of India, because the disturbed situation of northeast of India Northeast of India was being used as a conduit for trafficking of drugs from Myanmar. And, you know, Kunsa of Burma, they were all responsible. And then some of our politicians became the biggest drug lords. And that's when I started investigating and found, oh, my God, this is what is happening in my region. And uh, when I started 
you know, doing my ground research means field work, I started, uh, you know, interviewing many, many women survivors, men, young people who have died in this conflict. And I was in this village of Wabgai Lamkai when I was interviewing women leaders and I heard gunshots. And I met this young girl who was only 21 and widowed. And her mother started crying, how can I feed you anymore? They should have shot you dead also. And I can never forget that moment in my life. I said to myself, I'm a researcher. I'm a scholar. I may be a professor one day. But what do I give back to the community for which I have taken the research away from them? And I remember I had 200 rupee note in my hand and I just gave it to her and said, you will live and we will find, we will try to find a way to live for you. And we bought a swing machine like a month. I collected money. We bought a swing machine and gave it to her and she started using that to stitch clothes and mosquito nets and, you know, Rebecca is, you know, was able to restart her life. And the more, um, Manipur is very interesting because of this conflict, you know, Milan, we have so many massacre sites in Manipur. I grew up in near a massacre site called the Herangoitong Massacre, where 13 people were gunned down. So I started with my brother on his bike. We went to look for massacre sites all over Manipur. The reason is we wanted to know if there are how many Akam Rebikas were there. And suddenly we found 200 women who are widowed due to this conflict. And in the conflict zone, Milan is very hard. You are suspected by the government if you want to do research. You are suspected by the armed groups, you know, also. It is, it is suspicion. So we said that, you know, let's start with working on women's issues. For, for, for us in a conflict zone, it's really important that we, uh, you know, we stay alive to be able to do our work. It's not a normal situation in Manipur. So we thought best is to look at the humanitarian angle. And that's how we started the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network in the year 2004. At that time, we didn't even know that it would be an organization, you know. It took us three years to actually launch it because we were scared. Because in Manipur, we were always told, don't ask questions. Don't raise your voice. Don't speak up. Otherwise, you will be shot dead, Milan. We grew up in a state of fear. So we worked very on the ground, very, very quietly. And within a span of about three years, we were able to reach about more than 300 villages. And we were able to start a whole network, which is now spanned all across the Indo-Burma border right now. You know, it's it's sort of hard to recall now, but before COVID struck, there was another policy issue that was dominating the headlines, and that's the Citizenship Amendment Bill or Citizenship Amendment Act after it was passed to the CAA. Uh, this act, you know, provides expedited citizenship for a host of mainly non-Muslim religious minorities who hail from one of uh, India's neighbors but who seek refuge inside of India. Uh, the passage of the CAA sparked an outcry across the country, especially because it was viewed in conjunction with another controversial subject, which was this National Registry of Citizens, or NRC. Um, tell us a little bit about why the Northeast in particular was so up in arms over the idea of the CAA. Yes. Again, such an important question, Milan. And what I'm going to share is something which will go beyond the binary explanation of Hindu-Muslim vis-a-vis NRC and the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, much before the protest started on the Citizenship Amendment Bill and the National Register of Citizens, when the Citizenship Amendment Bill was actually tabled in the Indian Parliament in 19, 2016, the first protest actually started in my home state of Manipur. It was led by women protesters called the Manipuri Women Marai Pabis, extraordinary group, of women leaders, and then it spread to Tripura and Assam. So there were massive protests in 2016, 17, 18. But because what happens in Manipur, Indian national television channels, Indian national media, or the international press doesn't reach, no one covered that story, Milan. And then, and then so that's one thing. And why are the people of Manipur and northeast of India against the Citizenship Amendment Act? This is because, contrary to the way in which the world is seeing 
this issue only as against the Muslims. We in the Northeast, if you look at the Citizenship Amendment Act, it says if you belong to, you know, Hindu, Parsi, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, and other minority, you see, and but if you're not a Muslim, you're not allowed. But the thing is, many parts of the Northeast of India actually, uh, you know, uh, use the indigenous faith, Milan. This indigenous faith, for example, Sanamahi, which my family practice where we worship the rays of the sun and the moon, is not a part of any established religion of the world. So the CA for us excluded us, excluded people who are live in so-called the neighboring countries who practice this faith, this indigenous faith. So it excluded us also, Milan. So that was one thing which we felt that it was not just a Muslim angle, but indigenous faith is not a part of the CAA. And as a result, we felt that we are in that exclusionary category, but no one in New Delhi, no NDTV, no Times of India, no New York Times ever reported that angle. Okay. The other side is this, which is very critical. The National Register of Citizens, uh, you know, Milan, this is very, very important, started in Assam, which is a neighboring state of Manipur. Very few people will know why did the indigenous people of Assam ask for a National Register of Citizens? They never asked for National Register of Citizens, Milan, initially. What they asked was to protect the indigenous people of Assam. This is what they asked in the late 70s, when the, uh, the violence in Assam started in 1979, Milan. And why did they start? The Assamese people felt that the indigenous land resources and territories have been inundated. The reason is, in the northeast of India, the government of India, unfortunately, has done population engineering just as it was done in native territories in America. This is something which the rest of India has failed to understand, and policymakers have failed to really understand what's happening. As a result, what is happening, the Northeast people got scared, and they asked the government of India to protect indigenous land resources and territories. They were not against outsiders. All they said was, we felt we will become minorities in our own land. For example, Tripura, another beautiful Asiatic nation state, which joined willingly the Union of India in 1949, the land which gave R.D. Burman, S.D. Burman, Milan, without which no Indian Grand Tamasha songs will ever be. <laughs> you know, songs which Asha Bosley and Lata Mangeshkar sang, composed by this amazing, they, these two people came from Tripura, but who knows about that? The indigenous people of Trimpura have become minorities, were reduced to about 17% of their population because India sort of put people who came from 1971 after the Indo-Bangladesh war into Tripura. That's fine. But then you've got to protect the political rights of the indigenous people of Tripura, which the government of India failed to do. As a result, there was armed rebellion. Thousands died. And today... The Tripura people, which belongs to S.D. Burman and R.D. Burman's group, they have become no political stay in their state right now. So that's what happened. And the SMS people said, we don't want to become another Tripura. We don't want to become. And same thing, they did it to Sikkim, where right now the indigenous people of Sikkim, the Lepcha Bhutias, have become like 30% of their own people. Uh, and, and it was inundated by a lot of uh, influx from 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 different communities, mostly the Nepali community. So this is what has happened. But but what happened was that the fear of the indigenous people was then turned. This is what happened. Was turned into this concept of anti-Muslim in Assam by the right wing forces. Milan, this is what happened. So the fears of the Assamese people for the protection of land was turned by right wing, even before Narendra Modi's government came to power, by those who are operating on the ground into securitizing the fear of indigenous people into anti-Muslim in Assam. And that became the National Register of Citizens. I want to clarify this through the Grand Tamasha, this because no one has explained this side of our story ever. And I want your viewers 
to understand this. In a 2019 blog, uh, Bina, you wrote the following. Uh, the concerned peoples of the Northeast region continue to protest the CAA with the hopes that the Indian government will recognize the serious issues that it raises. Do you feel in the end like your voices were heard? Because, you know, the government eventually did revise the bill and exempted large parts of the Northeast uh, from its ambit. Uh, were you satisfied with the changes that were made? Um, no. We were not satisfied because actually what, um, you know, um, Home Minister Amit Shah did was he gave money for, for example, inner line permit. The inner line permit is actually an old British colonial, uh, you know, uh, act, which actually protects tea, you know, timber and elephants. It doesn't protect human beings. So uh, and government of India, just like it did by revoking the autonomy of Kashmir, or imposing the CAA, the current government of India can do anything. It can give, it can take, any time. We have no surety that this will protect the people of the Northeast of India. And currently, as I said, during COVID-19, how come the same government has allowed the permission to ensure that the construction of dams are resumed in the Northeast of India, as well as coal mining, in one of the world's most biodiversity hotspots, which would result in, you know, sort of hurting what I call the environmental violence done on indigenous territories. So no, Milan, it is not enough. And the government of India, if it is sincere in its approach, should actually start first by removing the martial law. You cannot claim to love someone at gunpoint, can you? So as long as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is clamped in the northeast of India for the last 62 years continuously, this act was supposed only to be for three to six months, but it is now for 62 long years, Milan. And unless the government of India does confidence-building measure to apologize to the people of northeast what it has done, remove the Indian Armed Forces Special Power Act, remove this, you know, withdraw CAA and the NRC, and ensure that Northeast people are treated as equal citizens of an equal country in the world's largest democracy, we will continue to resist, we will continue to speak out, whatever it takes. Bina, I want to end this conversation by asking you about, you know, activism in Manipur and across the Northeast. You know, when you and your colleagues are out there on the front lines, whether it's advocating for, you know, deepening democracy, for gender justice, for the rule of law, what sort of real life obstacles do you face when you're trying to carry out your core mission? From, physis for, from wanting to be a physicist, I have been labeled as an activist by Indian media. I don't know what is the term activism means, but Milan, what I do know is for someone who has a conscience, who have the light of knowledge and who feel for our communities, if you see repeated violence done on our bodies, on our soil, on our land, on our rivers, on our water and our environment, I think we couldn't keep quiet. And this is exactly what happened to me. I, I was happy as a scholar, as a, as a, you know, on my way to finishing my PhD when I started the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network, because we realized that this conflict will not end tomorrow. And what happens that in the conflict, so many families, conflict affect the poorest of the poor, the marginalized, the minorities, the indigenous, in worse ways that you can ever, ever imagine. So it's been... Um, you know, a very, very long journey. It was very tough uh, in initially. And, you know, starting, you know, a work like this is, is not easy at all, Milan. We were, when we first started our work, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we were asked not to speak about the Northeast outside India. And I told the government agencies who interrogated me for hours that I'm just a citizen of India who happened to be born in the Northeast, trying to find solutions to this longest running conflict in Asia. Don't I have a right to use my intellect and my knowledge to find it? Open a file on me, 
All I'm trying to do is to deepen democracy and rule of law. So we started our work, even knowing that there are threats. And then we had threats from armed groups. And because when we started doing our work, connecting with New Delhi and other like-minded people, people thought that we are a part of counterinsurgency operations. So we have been threatened from both state and non-state groups, Milan. It has been very harsh on me personally. It has been harsh on my family. I don't work alone. I work with a team of over 24 people in Delhi as well as in the Northeast and Indo-Burma border. Many of our colleagues have been threatened and many of our other people have been imprisoned under National Security Act. But as I said, that we do this work and we always say one day India will thank us for deepening democracy because when we ask for the removal of an Armed Forces Special Powers Act, we are saying that in, we want the democracy of India to be a pristine democracy. You cannot have a martial law in the world's largest democracy. So we always say what we're doing, one day India will thank us for deep, deepening democracy and rule of law. My guest on the show today is Bina Lakshmi Nepram. She is the founder of the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network, and she also serves as the convener of the Northeast India Women's Initiative for Peace. Uh, Bina, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I know this can be sometimes a difficult conversation to have because these issues are very personal, they're very present, they're ongoing. Um, but uh, congratulations to you on all you've accomplished thus far and hope that you'll come back on the show down the road and, and tell us more about your work and how and, and the progress that you're able to achieve. Thank you, Milan, for including our voice uh, in your important podcast, which I truly enjoy um, You know, uh, listening all your episodes. And I hope inclusion, diversity, and including our stories in policymaking, foreign as well as domestic, that's the way out because you cannot have an informed foreign policy or a domestic policy if you exclude the voices of 45 to 50 million people of northeast of India. So thank you so much to Grant Tamasha for including our story today. Grant Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.